This is Michael Altos recording Clinical Pharmacology Part 2. We're going to move on now to our volatile anesthetics. And the first one is halothane. You may think that halothane is not appropriate for discussion. None of you have ever seen halothane, most likely. But there are many countries in the world that still use halothane. It does still appear on some standardized exams. And actually, there are children's hospitals that still like to use halothane as an induction agent. Halothane is cheap and safe. It's used worldwide. Its effects include myocardial depression, which we referred to a little bit last week. It can decrease blood pressure and cardiac output. It can slow the conduction in the heart, and it can sensitize the heart to catecholamines. So patients getting epinephrine or other catecholamine situations may have more arrhythmias. Similar to nitrous oxide, it increases respiratory rate and decreases tidal volume, but it does actually decrease your minute ventilation. It decreases your hypercapnic drive, and it is a very potent bronchodilator. In fact, all of the inhalational anesthetics are bronchodilators. Halothane is also sweet and non-pungent. So while all of the inhalational, I should specify, while all of the volatile agents are potent bronchodilators, so that's all of them except nitrous oxide. But they don't all have a sweet smell, and some of them are pungent, which means they stink and they make you cough. And we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. It has an effect on autoregulation in the brain, which means the uh, system by which your brain has constant cerebral blood flow regardless of blood pressure. And it causes a lot of dilation of blood vessels, which can increase your cerebral blood flow and decrease cerebral metabolic rate. <clears throat> like all of the volatile agents, it can potentiate your neuromuscular blockade and has some muscle relaxation um, qualities of its own. And like all of the volatile agents, meaning everything except nitrous oxide, it does trigger malignant hyperthermia. In the kidney, it decreases kidney function, mostly due to decreased renal blood flow. Halothane is most notable for its effects in the liver. It does decrease liver blood flow quite a bit, and it also impairs hepatic drug clearance. Halothane is metabolized to trifluoroacetic acid, which is a toxin, and about 20% of halothane is metabolized instead of being exhaled. One in five adults will experience some mild hepatotoxicity after halothane anesthetic. And in the old days, there used to be a place on the pre-op record where you would make a note if a patient had had halothane within the recent year or so. This is different than halothane hepatitis, which was rare, but it was a massive hepatic necrosis often leading to death after exposure to halothane. And this was probably some sort of immune mechanism, which may have been genetic, and patients would get eosinophilia, a rash and a fever, and ultimately necrosis of their liver. Halothane, therefore, is contraindicated in patients who have had liver dysfunction after prior exposure to halothane, patients with significant intracranial hypertension, patients who have severe cardiac disease, or who have a pheochromocytoma because of the increased catecholamines, and other cardiac depressant medications or medications that increase sensitivity to catecholamines may be contraindications to halothane. Take a moment to consider any questions and then we will move on. Sevoflurane, which is the agent I'm sure you all use most, doesn't have a lot of interesting things to say about it. It's not pungent. It's got very low solubility, which makes it an excellent choice for inhalation induction. Because it's not very soluble, patients have fast emergence. In fact, so fast that the literature describes a post-operative delirium, sort of a sevoflurane delirium, especially in pediatric patients. The effects of sevoflurane are pretty minimal in the heart. They're pretty standard in the lungs the decrease in minute volume, and the blunting of hypoxic and hypercapnic drives. It is a bronchodilator, just like all of the other volatile agents. Its effects in the brain are pretty typical. 
It increases cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure at high doses and decreases brain activity, cerebral metabolic rates. It does cause some muscle relaxation, enough that you could actually intubate children with just seboflurane, and it potentiates neuromuscular blockade and triggers malignant hyperthermia. Most significant about seboflurane is the question of elimination. It does undergo a very small amount of liver metabolism. There is some fluoride ion that's created, which could be nephrotoxic, but has not been shown to be a clinical problem. The biggest issue is compound A, which occurs with barrel lime or maybe soda lime CO2 absorbers. Compound A has been shown to be nephrotoxic in rats, and as you turn down your fresh gas flows, and temperature of the circuit increases, and concentration of sevoflurane increases, and case duration increases, compound A becomes more and more of a problem. The issue is that they have never ever shown any renal injury in any human due to compound A exposure. So there are official recommendations, but there is absolutely no human data to support these recommendations. The recommendations are that you should run your sevoflurane at a fresh gas flow of at least two liters per minute if the exposure will exceed two mac hour, which either means two mac for one hour or one mac for two hours or half a mac for four hours. And you should never go below one liter per minute with sevoflurane. I would point out that we have some absorbers nowadays and at our hospital we stock these absorbers now standard, which are unable to generate compound A. So a lot of this discussion would be irrelevant. There are no contraindications to sevoflurane. It is safe to use in patients with renal disease and pretty much any other condition, except, of course, malignant hyperthermia. Isoflurane is sort of like the older brother of sevoflurane. It has a lot of similarities. It does cause some cardiac depression, but not very much. Unlike sevoflurane, it is an irritant. It's pungent in the lungs. So you would not want to use it for an inhalational induction. But during a case, it is a bronchodilator at MAC doses. There's not a whole lot of unique things to say about isoflurane otherwise. It's metabolized to trifluoroacetic acid and can cause some fluoride levels, but once again, we have not seen any clinical issues with this, and I can't think of any contraindications to isoflurane. Again, it's sort of the big brother of sevoflurane. It's a little bit less soluble, but it's perfectly fine to use for any case. I'm sorry, it's a little bit more soluble than sevoflurane. Desflurane structurally is actually very similar to isoflurane but it is much, much less soluble. It's also less potent. The MAC of desflurane is like 6%, whereas the MAC of ISO is closer to 1%. Desflurane is unique because it has a very high vapor pressure, and in fact, it requires a special vaporizer. If you look at your list of um, properties of the anesthetics, you'll see that desflurane has such a high vapor pressure that it can actually boil at room temperature, especially at high altitudes or if the room is warm. And changes in temperature or altitude could really affect the concentration of agent being delivered through a normal vaporizer. So we use a special vaporizer that heats desflurane to a gas and then injects it into a fresh gas flow. Desflurane, like SIVO, is so insoluble that it causes a very fast emergence and some post-op delirium. Like isoflurane, it's a bronchodilator, but it's pungent and irritating. And it will r routinely cause laryngospasm and um, breath holding if you try to use it for an inhalation induction. The only interesting thing about toxicity that you should know is that a desiccated CO2 absorbent, so if it's been allowed to dry out, can lead to formation of carbon monoxide. And again, some of the very modern absorbers are unable to form carbon monoxide with desflurane. The only contraindication to desflurane is I would consider avoiding it in a patient who has very severe asthma, and I would not use it as an inhalational 
induction agent. But in most asthmatics, I will be happy to use desflurane without any concerns. I just want to point out for a minute, nothing that you need to memorize for an exam, that we can actually calculate the cost of an anesthetic by using this formula here, which looks at the concentration you're using, the fresh gas flows, the length of the case, the molecular weight of the agent and its cost per milliliter, and then a correction factor times the density. And if we look at isoflurane, and these are old numbers, so they may be different now, a bottle of isoflurane is only $2.50, a bottle of desflurane is $100. A bottle of SIVO is $210, but of course you don't need as much SIVOflurane, you only need 2%, whereas desflurane you need 6%. And looking at anesthetics of different duration, you can see how much a typical anesthetic costs. And you can get an idea of the tenfold increased cost of a desflurane anesthetic. But this is assuming a certain fresh gas flow. With desflurane you might use a much lower fresh gas flow than with, say, SIVOflurane. So what is the big deal? Why do people choose these more expensive insoluble agents like desflurane versus something like sevoflurane? Many people will use it in the operating room and say, you know, I didn't really see much of a difference. And a lot of that has to do with what your recovery variable is. So if you want to see how long does it take a patient to respond to command, well here's after two hours of one and a quarter MAC anesthesia, which is a lot more anesthesia than I ever use. So after two hours of that, the desflurane people took 10 minutes to respond to command and the SIVO patients took about 16 minutes. So perhaps it might be a little bit um, longer until you get out of the operating room. After an 8-hour anesthetic, they saw a pretty significant difference. And again, oriented, when the patient is able to say where they are or something like that. But the truth is, a lot of us take patients to the PACU when they're not really responding to commands or oriented. And so you might not see much of a difference in the OR. But where you will see a difference is in the PACU. You have to consider how much desflurane, how much SIVO or desflurane do I need to get out of this patient's body before I can take them to the operating room, take them to the PACU, or discharge them home, or send them up to the floor. So maybe if all you need to do is get rid of 60% of the drug, well, this is sort of like context-sensitive halftime here. After how much anesthesia, how long does it take to get a 60% decrease in levels of the agents? And they're all pretty similar. But it might be that I need them to be 80% different before I can get them out of the operating room. And now, after a longer anesthetic, isoflurane is going to take longer to wake up. And I need more than 90% elimination before the patient can protect their airway. And now I can see a really big difference in these three drugs. So it might not make much of a difference in my operating room turnovers, but I could have quite a buildup in my PACU. And if I'm running an expensive PACU or an outpatient surgical center, I really want my patients to be awake and safe to go home as quickly as possible. And you may see savings with desflurane, even though it's the most expensive of the three agents. Here's a study that showed how many minutes after the patient could follow a command were they able to swallow water without coughing or drooling. And here, it took sevoflurane patients almost more than 10 minutes before they could reliably do that, whereas the desflurane patients were doing it three minutes after being able to respond to a command. So this might be an example of how we don't see a difference in the operating room, but we really see a difference in these agents when it comes to being fully recovered. Some people have asked, why don't I just use something cheap like isoflurane during the case and then switch to desflurane near the end of the case? People did studies and showed that here is the uh, how many people were awake at the end of an isoflurane anesthetic versus the desflurane anesthetic. And here's where, and the um, green is the crossover, where they switched them from desflurane, from iso to des, and they showed that there really wasn't much of a difference. There are still people who do this, but there hasn't been a lot of data to support it. We will stop here. Feel free to contact me with questions, and we'll pick up with the next recording.